And now for, uh, to handle the moderation of, of our main panel, let me turn uh, over to the uh, able hands of Mr. Anthony Kim, uh, who is the research manager and editor on the in, of the uh, Index of Economic Freedom at the Heritage Foundation. Please welcome Mr. Anthony Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Kim with the Heritage Foundation. I welcome, and I welcome you back to Washington, D.C. My role as a moderator is pretty simple, but I want to make a quick, uh, two important announcement. Just in case of emergency, exit is on your backward, so you have to exit that way, not on this side, okay? Here we have a panelist who's going to present an ideas that what we need to do in terms of solving and dealing with the Korean Peninsula issue. So exit is back way. Now, I need your undivided attention during our next one and a half hour panel discussion. This is a neat treat you are in. Uh, this is happening at a very critical juncture. So what you're gonna hear is very unique and very practical ideas. Now, obviously, we are not offering any silver bullet answer. It's gonna take time, but this is a process, so I just wanna remind you that. To begin our panel discussion, we're gonna start from Mongolia. You may wonder, why do we start with Mongolia? See, if you recall, back in April and May, when people were talking about this summit in June, there were three countries people talked about. Singapore, Switzerland, and Mongolia. And Mongolia is very unique and geostrategic location between Russia and China, and northern neighbor of the whole Korean Peninsula that offers very unique perspective. So to lead us uh, through that uh, uh, strategic angle, we have uh, Dr. Alicia Campy. Uh, she's the president of the Asian Political and History Association. She was a former U.S. Department of Foreign Service officer in Singapore, Taiwan, Japan, and of course, Mongolia. Please give us a well warm welcome to Dr. Campy. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim. I want to thank the um, uh, Global Peace Foundation and the Alliance for Korea United Organizing Committee for holding this um, very important roundtable discussion. And of course, um, thank particularly um, Dr. Fuller from the uh, uh, founder of the Heritage Foundation who has been such a um, uh, active proponent of discussing this issue in the United States. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the importance of small states to the Korean unification process for Northeast Asian development. And I'm going to give you a few ideas about trends that are um, in, right now in process in the area, and also uh, different kinds of ways for us to look at Northeast Asia and beyond to see if we can find ways to um, break out of some of the log jams that have um, caused delay and impasse in the Korean um, talk situation. Uh, what is the purpose of uh, a small state? And um, how can we look at small states in the region to help with Korean um, um, peninsular issues of various sorts. So one of the ways that I want to propose is for us to move from the peninsula and look now towards um, what we would call um, the East Asian or Greater Asian region and move even further across and look towards the Eurasian continent. At the end of November, Mongolian State Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Davosarin, participated in a forum in Ulaanbaatar themed peace process on the Korean Peninsula. In his remarks, he praised this year's positive trend epitomized by the direct talks between the Republic of Korea and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea to strengthen peace and security on the Korean Peninsula as well as the historic US DPRK summit meeting in Singapore, 
noting that Mongolia highly values this positive trend. He expressed the hope that all issues would be solved peacefully and offered Mongolia's help in contributing towards solving this and other pressing regional matters. As the only Northeast Asian nation not involved in the six-party talks, Mongolia was often left out of the discussion about resolving the region's most intractable security issue, the North Korean nuclear crisis. Yet unlike the other parties involved, Mongolia does not have the complex history with North Korea of other states in the region and does not present a potential security threat to Pyongyang. When Sakia Elbigdorj became Mongolia's president in 2008, he made it a priority for the small nation to use its goodwill to act as a good faith constructive bridge of back channel communication with the DPRK that stemmed from Mongolia's legacy as a former communist satellite and a new strong economic relationship with Seoul since 1990 when the Mongols adopted de democracy and the free market. The governments of Elbigdorj and his successor, Batuluk, served over the past decade as conduits for discussions between Japan and North Korea about abducted Japanese citizens, hosted meetings between North Korea and the US and Japanese official delegations, provided food aid, and promoted five annual iterations of the Ulaanbaatar Dialogue on Northeast Asian Security in order to offer a platform to set the foundation for multilateral cooperation on peace and security in the region. One of the primary ways Mongolia has sought to engage North Korea is by presenting itself as an example of a country that was able to make economic reforms peacefully while balancing its powerful neighbors China and Russia. Much like Mongolia, North Korea possesses substantial mineral deposits and the Mongols have offered this as one path for the North to develop its economy while retaining its sovereignty. Another small state that already has become involved in solving Korean Peninsula issues is Singapore, the host of the June summit. This was more than a security and neutrality choice, but reflected a history of trade and consular relations between the governments. In fact, Singapore established consular relations with the DPRK in 1969, two years before doing so with the ROK. Singapore consistently was one of North Korea's largest trade partners. In 2016, Singapore was ranked as North Korea's eighth largest trading partner and the sixth largest exporter to North Korea until the November 7, uh, 2017 trade ban was imposed. It is reported that North Korea secures up to 300,000 tons per quarter of oil from Russia via Singapore. Uh, the island also supplies the Pyongyang government's luxury shops, and Singaporeans manage Sam Tai Sung, the first North Korean fast food chain. But we can look for other smaller nations that might be able to play intermediary roles to further denuclearization and unification on the Korean Peninsula. If we recognize recent trends in the greater Asian region and utilize the inclusiveness and meshing networks in these Asia-only groupings that result in hybrid regionalism and noodle bowl institution building. And this is an example here of what they call the noodle bowl. We can link Northeast Asia to the ASEAN plus three or to the Eurasian continentalism epitomized by the Chinese Belt and Road concept to highlight voluntary agreements that re respect state sovereignty, promote government-guided strategies to support exports, protect businesses serving in local markets. Slow progress in global trade talks has led to a surge of such trade agreements, 
uh, or free trade agreements. And here, this um, slide diagrams the um, extent of the uh, bilateral um, agreements. In um, 2000, there were only three such bilateral free trade agreements, whereas by 2012, there were more than 60. Today's Asian integration relies on a large number of bilateral crisscrossing foreign trade agreements. There is no true integration hub in East Asia, but rather many spokes. In short, market-driven uh, regionalization dominates uh, institutionalized regionalization. And thus, one of the features that could be employed is um, the noodle bowl strategy of economic linkages that expands intra-regional trade. Let me suggest two potential small states on an enlarged Asia map that could serve as intermediaries uh, for the Korean government, Kazakhstan and the Philippines. Home to 100,000 ethnic Koreans who moved or were deported to Kazakhstan in the 20th century, the Koryo Sarams helped to strengthen ties between the two countries. Kazakhstan is recognized for its rapid growth and modernization since independence from the Soviet Union in 1991 and is the leading economy in Central Asia. South Korea and Kazakhstan have witnessed deepening economic ties as Kazakhstan has become the Republic of Korea's most important trading partner in Central Asia. There are currently more than 400 joint economic projects between Kazakh and South Korean companies in the banking, power, and oil sectors. Uh, <clears throat> just as importantly, Kazakhstan, which once held the fourth largest nuclear stockpile with over 1,400 warheads, relinquished all of these Soviet-era weapons by April 1995 and declared itself a nuclear-free state that could be a model for the DPRK. Then there is the Philippines. The Filipinos established formal relations with the DPRK only in 2000, and despite this nation's anti-communist policies and close relations with the U.S., in 2017, it reportedly was the third largest trading partner of North Korea. South Korea is a major provider of donor assistance to Manila, and bilateral trade volume stands at $15 billion. There's also a lot of people-to-people -people ties. Um, when we look at what can we do beyond using the small states, we should be looking at non-traditional security and economic cooperation. Um, in the areas of disaster prevention, environmental management of common resources such as water and air, transportation link and energies. This prism of cooperation would by definition lead to strengthening Korean Peninsula unification momentum. This slide indicates some of the potential areas. One example is the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction under UN ausp auspices. And then there is the Greater Tumen River Basin Initiative under the UNDP that is exploring energy pipeline, electricity supergrids, and tourism linkages, and transportation, especially rail, expansion into North Korean economic zones such as Ranjin Sombong. In the transportation field, the Rajin Hassan Russia Railroad Development Project has mirrored President Park Kyung Hee's Eurasia Initiative and her promotion of a rail transportation strategy called Silk Road Express that would connect rail and road networks from the South Korean city of Busan to Europe. The economic zone of Rajin Sombong, or Rasan, is located at the northeastern border of North Korea, adjacent to China and Russia. Created in 1991, Rasan is of growing interest as a transit point for Russian, Chinese, and Mongolian trade with Eurasian and Asia-Pacific partners. 
Unlike the Chinese special economic zones, port and rail logistics development in North Korea has taken place prior to major industrial development. This strengthens Rasan as a potential gateway and growth pole in Northeast Asia. The Rajing Hassan Yale Rail Project was designed to turn North Korea's ice-free northeastern port of Rajin into a logistics hub for sending cargo by rail to and from East Asia and Europe via the Trans-Siberian Railway. Rasan Khan Trans, the Russian-North Korean joint venture, is supposed to implement the rail and port renovation project. Progress has already been made on improving the um, port facilities, which I showed you in the previous slide, so that on November 2014, a test run of 40,500 tons of Russian coal was delivered to South Korea from the Russian town of Hassan via Rajin on a new rail spur. Mongolia tested shipping 25,000 tons of coal to Rajin in early 2017. The final piece in the transport puzzle is the reconnection of the Kyonggi line linking Seoul with Xinyuju on the Chinese border and the Donghai line running north-south in the eastern coastal areas. This would link 70 million people on the Korean peninsula to the Trans-China Railway and the Trans-Siberian Railway which can then go all the way to Europe. Such a Trans-Korea railway will reduce transportation costs by about a third and cut transit times in half. Uh, the key to the success of this zone at Rasan is to be effective as a stimulator to bo both to Korean unification and overall regional in integration. And this must be increasing um, rail cargo's economy of scale based. This slide provides suggestions on how opening a trans-Korean rail route as a gateway for the Eurasia transport network could be realized. It includes moving factories from Japan to around Vladivostok to join other Japanese car factories there. And also, uh, suggesting that the, the growing mineral exports from Russia and China and eventually the DPRK would be routed eastward to energy resource starved Japan and increasing the economic trade between Japan and Korea to the Central Asian republics and on to the Middle East and Europe. So what may we conclude from all of this? Number one, a united Korean peninsula can be a bridge to Eurasia, while at present it is a barrier. Number two, Asian trends towards all Asian networks, even bilateral trade arrangements, are forming a noodle bowl of institutional meshing mechanisms that can assist in easing tension on the Korean peninsula. Small states on the periphery, of the peninsula can be utilized as bridges and, me and mediators because they have their own agendas which present North-South Korean stalemate blocks. Number three, since both the ROK and DPRK benefit from the easing of political tensions when they concentrate on non-security and economic cooperation, they're more likely to make progress in these areas. Other nations throughout the greater Asian region also will benefit economically. Number four, the key for peninsula economic development and integration into the Northeast Asian region and the wider continent is the Rasan Economic Development Zone. And number five, rather than choosing winners and losers, the best approach is to let a variety of initiatives proceed to build trust, economies of scale, economic growth, and a new transporter transportation connectivity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Campy, that informative uh, uh, presentation. I just want to submit a footnote. Mongolia is also known as third neighbor in the United States. Mongolia obviously has a Russia and China. They don't say which one is number one neighbor, number two neighbor. 
They just try to make it strategically vague, but they say Washington, D.C., United States, is their uh, most important third neighbor. So there got to be some kind of elevated relationship between United States and Mongolia, and we shall see. By the way, we really appreciate your undivided attention towards this podium. While you are doing it, I notice that some people still say hello to your mobile. That's fine, as long as you do your social media, tweeting about today's event and all that. But if you are not doing that, it's time to say, see you soon, OK? <laughs> now, this is a bit of unique conference because, again, like I said earlier, we are not trying to offer a silver bullet for the solution. We cannot possibly do it. But this is really about expanding our horizon. For that matter, I'm delighted, honored to have our next speaker, Ambassador John Everard. Uh, this is a very special occasion for us because uh, Ambassador John Everard, actually he joins from London today. I'm not sure which equation is more complicated, Brexit or North Korea issue. He will tell us that. But over the course of his distinguished career, 27 years as a British diplomat, Ambassador Everard served in many countries around the world, including China. And he was appointed ambassador twice before undertaking his final assignment as the United Kingdom's ambassador to DPRK. Just in case you don't know about DPRK, that's North Korea's formal name, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. This is one of the most repressed regime, but in their official country name, they have all the good things, Democratic, Republic, people self. So it's kind of oxymoron here. So while in North Korea, Ambassador Everard had the opportunity to travel extensively around North Korea and witness the scenes of daily life experienced by normal North Koreans. And he has a unique view. So for that matter, I think we have a real treat from Ambassador. So Ambassador, without further ado, podium is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, it is indeed Troy, curious that uh, North Korea calls itself democratic. There again, this country calls itself united. Um, and thank you, everybody, for inviting me here. Uh, it's a pleasure, of course, to, to be here, to address such a distinguished audience. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that uh, the debate uh, that we can have will uh, do, contribute something uh, to the, the vexed question of uh, reunification of the Korean Peninsula. It always intrigues me uh, that so many Koreans talk about unification rather than reunification. Are you or are you not one people? Hmm? Um, the question that I've been asked to talk about today uh, is uh, what are uh, four to five important steps to move towards a different dynamic uh, on the Korean Peninsula that will make unification possible. So I'm taking it by starting point that everybody agrees that unification is desirable. I'm also taking it by starting point that we are talking about peaceful reunification. Uh, I, that if you talk about a military solution to the peninsula, a whole different set of issues arise, which I probably shan't have time to go into today. In pursuit of this, I am going to talk about three sets of issues associated with three countries. Uh, South Korea, North Korea, and China. And having looked at some of those issues, I'm going to go on to suggest uh, a few things that you might want to start doing now uh, if you want to uh, move uh, towards reunification of the Korean nation. Let's start with South Korea. Uh, South Korea is very, very fond of studying other people's experience of reunification, uh, mostly Germany, um, less Yemen. And having seen what has happened in Yemen since reunification, perhaps that's understandable. Uh, but Korea is very different. The lessons that can be drawn from other people's experience are necessarily uh, limited. Unless uh, you believe that Kim Jong-un is, in fact, North Korea's Gorbachev. Uh, or North Korea Juan Carlos, which some people do, is an interesting point and one that we might be able to explore a bit later. Um, the big problem, I think, that we face uh, over reunification uh, of the Korean Peninsula in South Korea is deep, deep suspicion of the idea in wide sectors 
of the South Korean population, especially amongst younger South Koreans. I think that the great majority of people uh, in this room uh, feel instinctively and passionately that Korea should be reunified. But opinion poll after opinion poll, uh, chat show after chat show shows that not everybody in South Korea does feel that. There is deep concern at the expense of reunification and there is a growing sense that North Korea is actually a foreign nation. That whereas decades ago, Korea was one, that is no longer the case. And that the two Korean states have drifted apart in a very dangerous way. So you have a lot of work to do with South Korean public opinion. This will require some very heavy lifting, as we are saying diplomacy, a, a lot of hard work in shifting people's points of view. Uh, and in particular, it seems to me that the time is nigh for a clear and honest debate about what you are trying to achieve and how you are going to try to achieve it. Now, significantly, the South Korean government can't do this. Uh, there are lots of reasons for this, which I won't go into just now. One of them, of course, is that it is at the moment enmeshed in what it thinks is a a series of talks with North Korea leading to reunification. Whether, in fact, they will lead to reunification, I think, is uh, a rather more difficult question. But uh, there's a deep reluctance by the Blue House to initiate a debate on what a unified Korea might look like, I think, for, for fear of scaring the horses. It does seem to me, therefore, that there is a real role here for non-government organizations like GPF to get stuck in and to fill that void. Let me talk about five issues that perhaps need addressing uh, in that debate. Firstly, the cost of reunification. Uh, President Bakun here talked about a reunification bonanza. Maybe, maybe, maybe over a very long term, but I think we have to face the hard fact that in the short to medium term, reunification of Korea is going to be hideously expensive. It's the, and I think that one of the big issues that we have to address here is that nobody has actually come up with even a plausible range of how much this is going to cost, let alone how that money is going to be found. This has had the effect of leaving a kind of scary unknown. A lot of Koreans, a lot of young South Koreans in particular, feel that they are being asked to sign a blank check. They've no idea how much money this is going to cost, and the unknown is frightening. We need to pin this down. We won't get exact numbers, but we do need to get a plausible range of what is going to be involved. That's the first point. The second, the advantages of reunification. As I said, people in this room probably see those instinctively. A lot of South Koreans don't and we're going to have to explain it to them. Uh, there is a clear need, I think, to set out a vision of how a future together is going to work and how that is going to be a better future for South Koreans than the future that we'll otherwise drift into of a continued division uh, on the peninsula. Thirdly, what I've called here national issues, Things like, if you are going to reunite the peninsula, where is your capital going to be? I suspect that everybody in this room will say straight away Seoul. There are a lot of people for whom it doesn't look that way. What happens to your relationship with the USA? Do you keep nuclear weapons? Now there is a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, we have a whole separate dialogue going on between the United States and North Korea over denuclearization. At the same time, of course, as President Moon Jae-in and uh, uh, Chairman Kim are, are, are talking about a detente of some kind uh, between North and South. Reunification of the peninsula does not automatically assume denuclearization. Let's be quite frank about that. But it's a point that does need to be addressed squarely on. Fourthly, the process, I said just now, you need to articulate 
what a unified peninsula looks like, you also need to explain to people how you're going to get there. I mean, it's a very basic point. Interim stages. Are you going to go through uh, kind of halfway points uh, where you have limited movement between the two careers? How are we going to manage that? Who's going to run the place in the meantime? And you also, fifthly, I think have to face up to the big and basic challenges that reunification presents. There is enormous economic inequality between the North and the South. Uh, the North, the South Koreans uh, enjoy multiples of North Korean income. If you simply reunify and leave the border open, most of North Korea is going to start to migrate towards the South. You're going to be flooded with unskilled uh, people uh, brought up in a tradition of deep corruption, deep political cynicism, who are going to be extremely difficult to integrate into South Korean society. What are you going to do about it? Um, the uh, corruption, criminality, also individual responsibility. If you suddenly spring the South Korean way of life onto North Koreans, you're going to cause chaos. When the Soviet Union fell, an old lady came up to a Western journalist in Red Square in Moscow and said, sir, please tell me, now that the Soviet Union is gone, who is responsible for my life? It's a question that millions of North Koreans will be asking. These people are not used to taking decisions. They are not used to having to work out for themselves what job they do, even who they're going to marry. It's, you've got a whole series of issues there that you need to grasp. That's just South Korea. Let me move on now to talk about North Korea. I think there is a, a, I can hear an assumption in many of the statements I hear uh, coming out of Seoul that North Korea is full of people just yearning to throw off the communist yoke and to be brought into the sunlit uplands of liberal democracy. Comrades, it is not like that at all. These are proud people. They are proud of their country. They are proud of what is achieved. You may condemn the nuclear program. They are proud of it. They think it makes South North Korea walk tall on the world stage. They are proud that there are no drunken American troops rampaging through the streets of Pyongyang, as they are told happens all the time in Seoul. They are proud that they've taken their own destiny into their own hands and that they have faced down the United States, Russia, and China. Remember that. And you have to accept that they are not going to be rushing towards you hoping for liberation. To them, this will not look like liberation. This will look like something quite different. Um, For all that, especially with the effect of the, the, the dramas, the, the soap operas that North Koreans keep smuggling from the South, there is a wish to enjoy a South Korean standard of living, even though they've no real idea of how you get to there, the work that's involved, the sacrifice that you and your parents went through to build South Korea uh, into the state that it is now. Uh, it's going to be uh, an uphill struggle to explain this to them. There's going to be a particular struggle with the North Korean elite. Even though uh, it's quite possible to articulate a vision of a united Korea in which the poorer North Koreans, and there's a lot of poor North Koreans, actually end up better off than they are now, it's very difficult to argue that for the North Korean elite. You are asking these people to give up their power, their privileges, for, for what? What do they get out of this? When Germany was reunified, one of the most effective propaganda videos that North Korea has ever produced was shown en masse to North Korean cadres. It was of former senior East German officials sitting destitute on park benches with nothing to do. And the message was clear. If we go down, if you allow reunification with the South without our guidance, that is you. And the trouble is, they're probably right. Unless you can work out 
a future for these people, you are going to have a significant bloc in North Korea that will resist unification at all costs. As a footnote, 30 years after German reunification, those guys are still sitting on those park benches. I want to move on now to China. Just as a final thought, though, on North Korea, a lot of talk of free elections across the Korean Peninsula. I say be very careful what you ask for. At the moment, there is still deep loyalty in North Korea to Kim Jong-un. If you had a free election across the Korean Peninsula tomorrow, Kim Jong-un would probably have the North Korean vote in his pocket. It would give him, what, at least a third of the electorate straight off. You would probably be looking at a unified Korea run by a free and democratically elected Kim Jong-un. <laughs> Is that what you want? I'm going to move on now to China. China, too, is deeply suspicious of reunification. Um, it's worried that a, a unified uh, Korea will, will, that, that will, will cause American troops to move uh, right up to the Chinese border, which, of course, is close to a Chinese geostrategic uh, nightmare. Uh, and it simply can't see much benefit to itself in reunification. Uh, Remember that Germany was not reunited until the Soviet Union gave assent. The same kind of dynamic happens with China over Korea. China is in a position to block reunification and probably will do unless somebody explains to China why reunification is in China's interests. That's frankly going to be a hard sell. Why should China support reunification? What's in it for China? At the moment, it's got a situation which may not be ideal, but at least it's manageable. And it has an asset, a geopolitical asset, uh, in North Korea. It often seems to me that one of the most important uh, aspects of current geopolitics is, is of course, the current tensions uh, between the United States and China, and that perhaps the best chance that Korea has of reunification is to remember that assets can be traded. China has no great emotional attachment to North Korea, and I'm fairly confident that if the North Korea were included in some kind of overall grand bargain between the United States and China, that China would throw North Korea under the bus without thinking too much about it. But you've got to get that grand bargain first, and the price that China exacts is likely to be eye-watering, the kind of price that makes me very glad that I'm not a US taxpayer. <laughs> OK, I've talked about three areas. Now, with all that, what actually do you do? And I've noted down here uh, four steps uh, that you might want to consider taking. Firstly, I said at the beginning, time for the debate, time to come out of the closet, time to set out your stall. What is it that you want? What is your vision for United Korea? How is this going to look? How are you going to get there? How much is it going to cost? Who's going to pay for it? There's a lot of questions there that nobody really wants to address. A lot of nettles that haven't been grasped, particularly in South Korea. Now is the time, particularly as, what for good reasons or bad, there has been some detente between North and South Korea. The South Korean government, for good reasons, is not going to address these questions head on. So, as I said, in steps uh, the civil sector and people like yourselves uh, who, have a, uh, who are much freer to talk than the Blue House. It will, of course, uh, mean treading on some toes. Uh, in South Korea, you have an entire ministry devoted to reunification, which must somewhere, we hope, have a blueprint for all this, but has been very, very shy about saying what that blueprint is. Uh, so you will be treading on their territory, but maybe, maybe uh, they will actually come out and tell everybody what the Grand Master Plan has been. Um, that's the first set. Secondly, you'll need to talk about these plans with lots of difficult people. The North Koreans eventually, the North Koreans, of course, will read 
anything that you write on this with rapt attention. They probably won't comment straight off. That's just not the North Korean way. But if you have back channels into North Korea, you know, make clear that you are prepared to talk informally about how this works, why it makes sense, and how North Korean interests get looked after. Uh, and you know, let, they'll, they'll then go into a huddle amongst themselves and they'll, they'll talk about things. They may come out and reject it out, all right, but at least you've then got a response. But talk about it with China. Now, talking about anything with China right now is frankly not easy. China is a deeply inward-looking country. It's got all kinds of headaches, uh, and not just, of course, geopolitical ones. It's got internal headaches, too. And getting any kind of response out of China uh, on even fairly straightforward issues is not easy. But you can probably engage at least some of the Chinese government think tanks, get a debate going within China, or rather reignite a debate within China about what happens on the peninsula. It's important to remember that there have been fierce debates within China already on North Korea. The Chinese really don't like the North Koreans. And there's a lot of, uh, of sense that China has been shackled to this kind of political fossil, which is simply inappropriate for a superpower of China's pretensions. Just a very quick anecdote of Imer. I know I'm, I've talked for, for a while. Uh, I was once sitting at a dinner uh, in Beijing, uh, waiting for a guest of honor, uh, who came so sort of rushing in about a half an hour into the dinner, panting and full of excuses. He said, I'm so sorry, he said. I just had, I just had to deal with a delegation of Iranians. And they, they came late, they talked and talked, and they were slimy. They were devious. They were dishonest. They were, they were like North Koreans, he said. <laughs> and I think that kind of attitude is fairly typical amongst Chinese. So you, you, you might well get a, an audience there. Talk to the Russians. The Russians don't have actually much to contribute to unification, but unless you talk to them and make them feel loved and wanted, they will sulk and they'll try to block it. It's just the way that Russia is. Talk to the Japanese. Um, at some point, somebody is going to have to start signing some pretty big checks, and the Japanese might well be prepared to contribute. Uh, I, I know a, a lot of you feel strongly about the Japanese, but you know, they have to be part of this equation. And a lot of this process is going to involve talking to people that you might not uh, choose otherwise to talk to. OK, third point. When you do that, wait for the reactions. Be prepared to be flexible. Try to take other people's points on board. It's most unlikely that the model for unification that you start off with is going to be the model that you end up with. Everybody will have different ideas. Remember that the North Koreans also have their own vision of reunification. Surprise, surprise, it is radically different from yours. And yes, guess where the capital is going to be. But listen to them. You know, these people have a right to be heard. They are supposed to be half of the country that you're rebuilding, right? You know, talk to them, talk to them sensibly, and, and see if you can achieve middle ground. Finally, uh, take it to the outer world. Uh, so far, I've been talking about talks within the region, uh, with the countries most directly involved. But this is a global problem, and it should be treated as such. You have a right as Koreans to expect involvement by the international community. So when you've got your ducks in a row, when you've had your screaming fits in Beijing, your table-thumping sessions in Moscow, and your long silences in, in Pyongyang, take it out. Take it to the wider community. Ask for help. Ask for support. Ask for financial support. Because you're certainly going to need it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Everard, that thought-provocative and very uh, insightful perspectives. I think we really learned a lot from you and uh, a lot more to unpack as we go. Now, as you know, uh, Washington is known for uh, many places to visit. Uh, every season, we welcome a lot of tourists. For policymakers and politicians around the world, that list includes an organization called the Heritage Foundation. Uh, the Heritage Foundation is a policy incubator, and we have a vision at the Heritage Foundation. Our vision is to build an America where freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society flourish. 
And I'm honored and glad to report that that vision and that fire is br burning brighter than ever before, uh, thanks to the gentleman who founded that organization called Heritage Foundation. And no wonder the Heritage Foundation has been named as one of the most effective policy think tank around the globe. Dr. Furner, who is our next speaker, is the founder and longtime former president of the Heritage Foundation. He served as an advisor to several U.S. presidents and the transition team of the president, Donald, Reagan, uh, Donald Trump, uh, whose administration embraced nearly two-thirds of the Heritage Foundation's recommendations. Among many, other, many honors he received, Dr. Furner was awarded the Presidential Citizens Medal by President now, Ronald Reagan, and the Ganghwa Medal by the late President of South Korea, Kim Dae-jung. Now, one personal note. Dr. Furner is fond to say, I'm a congenital optimist. He's born optimist. He's natural optimist. But if you think about that, without being optimistic, how can we deal with this complicated North Korea issues. It's a process. And I think Dr. Furner truly believe in this process of adding and multiplying the positive forces of those optimism. And that's why we are here today to remind you. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Edwin J. Furner. Thank you very much, Anthony. Welcome to Washington, all my good friends from so many different parts of both the United States and uh, from around the world. Action for Korea United, uh, the Global Peace Foundation, so many others who are involved in this, thank you very much. I have a tough act to follow. I will not try to answer the ambassador's challenges, certainly. I, uh, he was quite correct also in stating that uh, at the moment this is not exactly the most hospitable uh, city just internally between one party and the other. If you uh, watch television, you'll get that impression, certainly. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge and recognize my dear friend, Dr. Preston Moon. He and I have co-worked on this particular question for a number of years together, what he does with the Global Peace Foundation uh, is indeed inspiring to all of us. This afternoon, we have a unique chance uh, to address the straightforward network uh, for many of the key issues that the ambassador so ably outlined to us and the key challenges. Factors affecting peace on the Korean Peninsula at the, these days have been happening at an incredible pace. Uh, if you've, I'm sure everyone here has read the news or heard the news over the last few days, let me just give you four very recent examples. In the good old days, any one of these specific items uh, would have occupied our thinking and the thinking of Korea watchers in conversations, debates, and discussions for days and possibly even weeks. The South Korean National Assembly has approved the revised and reinvigorated U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement. Wonderful. That, again, could be a discussion for a week or for at least one conference. Two days ago, the front page of the Wall Street Journal had a featured article on how the DPRK is violating U.N. international sanction policy by putting their own people, particularly their military, in training positions in third world countries, particularly in Africa, to earn foreign exchange for the government back in Pyongyang. Front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, that again would normally be worth at least a week's discussion. Within the last 24 hours, uh, renewed calls citing the U.S. ROK discussions and debates on the costs of the 27,000 U.S. troops currently quartered in the ROK. Uh, how are we going to uh, renegotiate with our friends in Seoul on the status of American forces in Korea? Something that 
again, occupies Korea watchers in great detail. Fourth, repeated assurances or assertions, particularly from Seoul, but also from Pyongyang, that there will soon be another summit between President Moon and Kim Jong-un, probably in Seoul. Uh, much uh, conjecture might accompany that. Here, I for one thought that after Singapore last June that things Korea would settle down a little bit, but that certainly has not happened. We are in fact involved in a very swiftly moving uh, policy environment that challenges all of us to rethink, to re-examine, and to uh, re-envision where we can be going. We're going through quite a turbulent period, period, and yet it's these are opportune and advantageous times as we work together to promote together lasting peace, freedom, and reunification of the Korean Peninsula. Let me take a few steps back. At a September meeting that took place in the UN General Assembly on the outskirts between our president and President Moon, the there was a successful discussion, really, of how the internal relationship, at least between Washington and Seoul, vis-a-vis -vis Pyongyang, should continue. It was noted that there remained much work to be done to accomplish their mutual goal and to eventually achieve the goal, as specified in Singapore, of fully verified denuclearization by the DPRK. The two presidents agreed on the importance of maintaining vigorous enforcement of existing sanctions to ensure that North Korea understands that denuclearization is the only path to economic prosperity and lasting peace on the peninsula, either in a reunified Korea or in two separate entities. Then just two weeks ago, President Trump and President Moon again held another short summit on the sidelines of the G7 in Buenos Aires. These important meetings have affirmed once again the long-standing ties that bind this capital and our country with Seoul and your country. That those ties that bind are as robust today, I believe, as they were any time in our history, including the time of the great sacrifice so many made during the Korean War. A critical objective in addressing the North Korean issue is to expand our alliance and to work together to establish a lasting solution for moving ahead. Indeed, 2018 has been a, a remarkable year to many of us who deeply care about the Korean Peninsula. Time and again, over the past quarter century, the United States has made it clear the world cannot accept a nuclear North Korea. In fact, that's not just the United States position, that's the world's position. Past diplomatic attempts to halt North Korean nuclear and ballistic missile development were quite dramatically unsuccessful. But now, I believe, we're at the beginning of a new chapter. Since taking office, President Trump has led the effective international pressure campaign on the DPRK that has resulted in the first significant diplomatic breakthrough in decades. Prior to January 2017, with talk of Little Rocket Man, who could have imagined that the President of the United States and the Chairman of the DPRK could actually meet in a neutral country, in a third country, uh, and have a face-to-face, -face, at least discussion, negotiation, and hopefully some agreement on some basic principles. During the historic Singapore summit, President Trump and North Korea, Kim, uh, surprised the world by sharing and 
demonstrating a common personal understanding of what must take place for the transformation of the U.S. DPRK relationship. Since then, the United States has engaged with North Korea in important ongoing discussions and follow on to the commitments that were made in Singapore. We remain committed to ongoing diplomacy at this critical juncture. We must not forget what's brought us this far in the discussion. It's not only the incredibly effective diplomacy uh, from both Washington and Seoul that I support and would uh, stand up and cheer. It's also the historic international pressure campaign that the UN has made possible through sanctions. And those sanctions are, as I said, the world's sanctions. They're not America's sanctions. And until the final denuclearization of North Korea is achieved and fully verified, it's our solemn collective responsibility to fully implement the UN National Security Council resolutions pertaining to North Korea, all of them. As many of you know, during the last presidential election, I had the honor to work with then candidate, then president-elect, and then President Trump as one of his senior advisors. Since then, I've had the honor to meet with him on a number of occasions to discuss this with him, with Vice President Pence, with other senior officials, uh, in the administration. In my view, this administration, from President Trump on down, has made it abundantly clear that if Kim Jong-un does follow through on his commitments, a much brighter future lies ahead for North Korea and for its people, and that the United States will be at the forefront of facilitating that brighter future. We all, all of us, want to see the time come as quickly as possible, but a path to peace and a brighter future is only possible through denuclearization. That means any other path North Korea may choose will inevitably lead to increasing isolation and increasing pressure from the rest of the world community. In previous forums with Action for Korea United and the Global Peace Foundation, I observed the vibrant power that the ambassador referred to of civil society engagement efforts to establish peace and security, to work people to people, if you will. Similarly, since its founding, the Heritage Foundation has recognized the importance of civic engagement and have encouraged entities throughout the United States to participate in the process to let their voices be heard. Your grassroots people power approach is the one that I also advocate during my tenure as chairman of the U.S. Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy under both Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. As we work together through the international forum to establish, through this international forum, to establish freedom and peaceful reunification on the Korean Peninsula, it's inspiring for me to see the broad spectrum of participants that have assembled here today and that are routinely brought together by this organization and by both Action for Korea United and by the Global Peace Foundation. I am confident that these efforts will continue to stimulate, broaden support throughout the country, throughout the citizenry, both in Korea and in the United States, and will increase every opportunity to demonstrate that, in, to, de, to disseminate information about the compelling vision of the power of freedom whose time I believe has come. It was just about two years ago that Dr. Moon invited me, invited me to write a preface to his wonderful and inspiring book, Korean Dream, A Vision for a Unified Korea. I commend it to all of you for a way forward, for a vision of where we will be when we overcome some of the obstacles that are obviously on the way. 
I must note that President Trump has summoned the international community to stand behind such an approach in his address to the Korean National Assembly in Seoul just last year. Let me quote the President. Korea stands strong and tall among the great community of independent, confident, and peace-loving nations. We affirm the dignity of every person and embrace the full potential of every soul. And we are always prepared to defend the vital interests of our people against the cruel ambitions of tyrants. Together, we dream of a Korea that is free, a peninsula that is safe, families that are reunited once again. We dream of highways connecting north and south, of cousins embracing cousins, and this nuclear nightmare replaced with the beautiful promise of peace. Until that day comes, we stand strong and alert. Our eyes are fixed on the north and our hearts praying for the day when all Koreans can live in freedom." End of quote. Whether my American colleagues like or dislike President Trump, whether they supported him or not, I can't come up with a better description of what our ultimate objective is. Anthony described me as Washington's congenital optimist, and I am congenitally optimistic that eventually there will be full peace, full freedom in a reunified Korea. We don't know yet how this unfolding chapter will happen. We don't know what incredibly complex steps will happen along the way. We're all hopeful that the current breakthrough in diplomacy can and will yield a brighter future for North Korea, for the entire Korean Peninsula, and indeed for the world, for all of us. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Fooner. And now, last but not least, our final address of the today's session will be given by Dr. Preston Moon, the founder and chairman of the Global Peace Foundation, which was established in 2009 and is currently active in over 25 countries. Dr. Moon's focus on common vision and universal principles and shared values has been guiding Global Peace Foundation in building innovative global networks of innovative policy solutions. He has been a lifelong passion for empowering young leaders, particularly in emerging countries. In fact, Dr. Moon brings a unique leadership approach and perspective to solving the ongoing division on the Korean Peninsula, which he outlines, as we heard from Dr. Furner in his book, Korean Dream, A Vision for a United Korea. Having known both Dr. Furner and Dr. Moon, I must say that these two distinguished gentlemen shares one common characteristic. Again, that's being an optimist. Being optimistic means being positive and open-minded and finding solutions in a consistent manner, in my definition at least. And again, I think that's why we are here. And let me remind you, this journey we are doing together is really about, once again, adding, multiplying, amplifying the positive forces of optimism. So without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Preston Moon to the podium. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to address this significant gathering at such a critical juncture in the turbulent history of Korea. Thank you all for your concern about the future of the Korean Peninsula and its impact on Northeast Asia and indeed the entire world. I wish to thank my good friend, Dr. Edwin Fulner, founder of the Heritage Foundation, a leading scholar and a true friend of Korea. I'm also greatly honored to meet for the first time Ambassador John Everett, former Br British ambassador to the DPRK, and noted Mongolian expert, Dr. Alicia Campi, for joining us here today. Please give them a round of applause. We also would like to warmly welcome from the Republic of Korea, 
a visiting delegation with Action for Korea United, including former Korean Ambassador to Uruguay, Che Bum Kim, Executive Vice Chair of the Korean American Association. Just give him another round of applause. At this time last year, the Global Peace Foundation, Action for Korea United, and our partners sponsored a related international forum on One Korea in Seoul under very different circumstances than today. In 2017, many in Korea were in denial that a hot war could be a real possibility. Most on the peninsula were accustomed to the vicious cycle of threat, crisis, talks, concessions that Pyongyang employed so effic efficiently and effectively in the past. Yet this time, it was very different. The Trump administration made Korea the top international policy for the US, taking strong leadership and reshaping the geopolitics of the region. It imposed biting sanctions and galvanized global support to enforce those sanctions, even getting China and Russia to follow suit. That was a break for the first time, and however briefly, from the Cold War framework which has dominated the Korean Peninsula issue. At the same time, sanctions were backed up by a credible U.S. military threat to the North, underscored by the example of U.S. airstrikes in Syria. This aggressive American response with the full support of the international community, especially the North's former allies, forced the hand of Kim Jong-un. This was possible since he had alienated his most important ally, China, by purging pro-Chinese factions in the North, like his uncle, Chang Song-tek. Furthermore, unlike his grandfather and father, he held a recalcitrant and often aloof diplomatic posture towards his former allies. Finally, his nuclear ambition to build a delivery system that could threaten the United States, Japan, and all of its neighbors in the Pacific Rim region, including China and Russia, became the catalyst for former geopolitical rivals to come together and contain Kim. In a relatively short period of time, Kim Jong-un's lack of geopolitical experience created a perfect storm of global condemnation on par with the United Nations response to the outbreak of the Korean War. Yet this time, unlike 1950, the North stood completely alone. This stark reality forced Kim to seek reprieve through his southern neighbor's desire to de-escalate the possibility of a hot war on the peninsula. The newly formed Moon Jae-in administration was more than eager to comply. Representing the legacy of Kim Dae-jun and Roh moon Yun, it was natural that Moon would see the North's overture as an opportunity to pursue Sunshine Policy 2.0. This would build his and the left's political capital domestically, as well as give him international bona fides as a peace broker. What followed was North Korea's participation in the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics and three subsequent highly publicized inter-Korea summit meetings between Moon Jae-in and Kim Jong-un. Understandably, the world reacted positively to these developments since war seemed to be imminent. It appeared that, South Korea, that the South Korean president's initiative to engage the North was easing the tensions on the peninsula. Yet the larger issue of global sanctions led by the United States, as well as its military option to take out the North nuclear capabilities, remained a threat to Kim Jong-un. Once again, he found a willing partner in Moon Jae-in, who took extraordinary steps to advocate direct bilateral talks between the United States and the DPRK, 
breaking with long-standing diplomatic practice. By early spring, an urgent message from Kim prompted a sudden meeting between South Korea's foreign ministry and the White House that set the stage for the Singapore summit, the first ever face-to-face meeting between the leaders of the U.S. and the North. Both Kim Jong-un's grandfather and father dreamed of having bilateral talks with the United States, since that would give the the North Koreans international legitimacy, especially after the fall of the Soviet Empire. The summit would give Kim what his predecessors could not accomplish, and thereby increase his stature at home and abroad as an equal to the American president. Once he stood utterly alone, yet with the help of the South Korean president, he was now poised to meet the very man who isolated and nearly brought him to the brink. The Singapore summit was to be his great comeback. The Singapore summit exposed the flaws in American foreign policy that has overwhelmingly relied upon the naive assumption that the U.S. could narrowly negotiate North Korea's complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization, CVID. In return for dismantling its nuclear program, the United States was prepared to aid the North's flagging economy and even ensure the protection and the survivability of the Kim regime. In so doing, the U.S. was willing to forfeit its basic values by ignoring the North's atrocious human rights record, as well as solidifying a two-state reality on the Korean Peninsula. Although the North agreed to these terms, most Koreans believe that Kim Jong-un had no intention of honoring this agreement. The U.S. failed to see that the North's clear nuclear program is more than just an insurance policy policy against Western aggression. It is Kim's crowning achievement in the face of a hostile world. It is a source of personal and national pride, as well as evidence of his intrepid independence from foreign influence. For Koreans whose fate had been determined by foreign powers throughout the 20th century, the need for independent self-realization is a powerful force and therefore admired when exhibited even by Kim. Nevertheless, shortly after the summit, the North made several concessions, such as closing obsolete nuclear test site, release of imprisoned Americans, the return of American service members' remains, and the secession of missile tests and other acts of provocation. These concessions were largely hailed in the West as great achievements in U.S. relations with the North. The Trump administration saw them as goodwill developed by the President and Kim and continued to believe that negotiations would lead to denuclearization. They assured the public that sanctions were still effective and there was no reason to ease them unless the North complied with their agreement. Unfortunately, the sanctions regime that initially brought Kim Jong-un to heel had already begun to unravel. Before the U.S. DPRK summit, Xi Jinping, the premier of China, invited Kim to a meeting in Beijing with full state honors. It was a first meeting of its kind between the two leaders since Kim took power in North Korea, and others, other meetings followed follow shortly thereafter. Ironically, the Singapore summit was the catalyst for mending grievances between China and North Korea. In addition, Shortly after the U.S. DPRK bilateral talks, the Russian foreign minister made a trip to Pyongyang to personally meet with Kim Jong-un, further eroding the sanctions regime. Subsequently, there was clear evidence that both China and Russia had violated their agreement to impose sanctions on North Korea. Unfortunately, the geopolitical reshuffling that had isolated Kim early in 2018 was undone by U.S. acceptance of bilateral talks with the North, since both China and Russia naturally perceived it as a threat to their own national interests on the peninsula. 
The Moon Jae-in administration looked at all these developments positively, since it was largely due to its efforts that Trump met with Kim, and in its view, avoided a potential hot war. Moon believes in engagement with the North, like his ideological predecessors. The Singapore summit gave him greater license to pursue that end. What followed was an evolving policy of greater cooperation with the North. The Moon administration then focused on relaxation of sanctions, and then the declaration of the end of war between the two Koreas and the United States to the chagrin of the US and Japan. On September 19th, in a speech in, in Rongrado Stadium, Moon stated that he and Kim Jong-un pledged to hasten the future of a common prosperity and reunification on our own terms. This statement was made under the principle of autonomy for our people where we ourselves determine our own fate, meaning the two Koreas and no other. Moon broadened the theme of North-South cooperation to advocate for global sanctions relief on behalf of North Korea. During the UN General Assembly on September 26th, he stated, now is a time that the international community should give something in return for the new choice and efforts that North Korea has made. On October 19th, in a gathering with the heads of European nations, he called on them to relax sanctions on the North, even trying to set up meetings on behalf of Kim Jong-un and other world leaders like Pope Francis. To make matters even worse, satellite imagery has recently revealed that the North continues to develop its nuclear and missile programs in direct violation of the agreement signed in Singapore. This evidence reaffirmed what many Koreans and skeptics, skeptics had already feared. The summit created an atmosphere of loosening sanctions and an unhealthy North-South cooperation that threatens the ROK, US, Japan alliance and its attempt to curtail North, the North's nuclear ambition. Clearly, when one objectively assesses the events of this year, Kim Jong-un has turned a potential disaster into a personal triumph. Under the current circumstances, the United States and the international community should reassess their Korea policy. Clearly, the bite of global sanctions has waned since the Singapore summit. Also, in the minds of many, the North Korean nuclear crisis has abated due to the perceived improved relations between the US and the DPRK. In this environment, can the US make a case for military in intervention? It seems unlikely. Then what is the viability of the US negotiating position in relation to its narrowly defined goal of complete, verifiable, and irreversible nuclear denuclearization in North Korea. With a weakened global sanction regime and a diminished credible military threat, the probability of success is very low. Yet those in favor of bilateral negotiations continue to believe that it is still possible, although they acknowledge now that it, it shall take time. At some point, They should assess the failed record of talks with Pyongyang on denuclearization since the early 1990s to today, through three subsequent presidencies to the current Trump administration. The fact remains that the longer negotiations, the less likely the desired outcomes. The North is a generational dictatorship and recognizes the ephemeral nature of democratic nations with presidential term limits and changing political tides. Over the years, it has learned how to manipulate its relationship with the ROK and the US to its benefit. Simply put, all it needs to do is drag out the talks to buy time and economic concessions while hoping for a change in domestic political fortune of its adversaries. The US should recognize its inability to execute on a narrowly defined endgame, especially when there is a moving goal line 
due to wishful thinking and poor planning. This has been proven as fact in our recent history. The failed and inconclu inconclusive military adventures in Vietnam, Iraq, and currently in Afghanistan are evidence of this. At tremendous cost of life and treasure, these conflicts were undertaken with limited objectives. U.S. policy failed to recognize the larger consequences and how much America would need to invest in time and resources to achieve a viable outcome. Given the current state of affairs, the U.S. should abandon its narrow bilateral approach to de denuclearization. It needs a comprehensive strategy, strategic framework, that has a clear vision of outcomes in America's natural, natu national interest, like it did after World War II with the Marshall Plan in Europe and MacArthur's reconstruction in Japan. It should set, a, set aside the hubris and faulty assumptions that narrowly defined goals can somehow be accomplished. History has proven that this will never happen. There are always unexpected consequences. I believe the only viable option at this point is that U.S. policy embraces the idea of unification as a necessary strategic approach to denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. The time is ripe for such a strategy, since both Koreas, after the North-South Summit in September of this year, are advocating for this end. The lessons of the Singapore Summit should not be lost by a narrow bilateral U.S. involvement in the future of the peninsula. As the world's superpower, it should not give cause to its geopolitical rivals, such as China and Russia, to interfere in what should be a matter of Korean self-determination. However, that is not to say that American leadership is not needed in guiding and incentivizing the process of unification. Like the Marshall Plan and Japan's reconstruction, U.S. aid and protection was critical for regional and national transformation to take place as the free expression of the people of Europe and Japan. This is the case since one needs to accept the fact that unification can be both a tremendous opportunity as well as a tremendous danger. On the one hand, it could fulfill the dreams of all Koreans who have sought to live in a unified homeland. But at the same time, it opens the possibility of a new nation dominated by Chuche ideology that no Korean would want to live in. Too much is at stake. Unification simply for the sake of unification is not an option. I have long recognized the need for such an out-of-the-box approach ever since my father pioneered the opening to North Korea through his groundbreaking meeting with Kim, Kim Il-sung in 1991. The approach that encapsulates these elements is summarized in my book, The Korean Dream, Vision of a Unified Korea. Up until the publishing of my book, all academic treatises on unification focused on the process of unification, leaving open the possibility of a wide range of outcomes. However, my approach starts with the goal of creating an ideal nation, separate from the legacy of the Cold War and based upon Korea's shared cultural history. It entails laying out clearly the principles upon which a unified Korea should be built. All Koreans, North and South, trace their origins back millennia to the Tangun story. Running like a thread throughout its 5,000 year history is the ideal of Hongi Ingan that is deeply embedded in that very history of Korea's founding. Hongi Ingan, living for the greater benefit of humanity, has always been a guiding principle at times of crisis. It was a motivating ideal for the independence movement that sought to create a new republic out of the ashes of the Chosun dynasty and Korea's annexation into the Japanese empire. It shaped the aspirations of the independence leaders to want more than just freedom from Japanese colonial rule. They believed, based on the Hongik Ingan ethos, that it was their destiny to create an ideal nation 
that would be an example to the world. The most significant milestone of the Korean independence movement came in 1919. On March 1st of that year, Koreans coalesced in a groundswell of support for the Korean Declaration of Independence and then proclaimed it peacefully in mass rallies across the nation. They aspired to create a nation that was unified, independent, and free. Though unfulfilled at the time, that aspiration still burns in the hearts of all Koreans, North and South. Outside of Korea, the United States provided an important base of support for Korean independence. Leaders in the U.S., such as Syngman Rhee and An Chung-ho, saw parallels between, between the founding of America and their own cause. They recognized that Hong Yik Ingan resonates with the universal principles expressed in the U.S. Declaration of Independence. In April 1919, they organized the first Korean Congress in Philadelphia to link their cause to the American experience, proclaiming the Korean Declaration of Independence in historic Independence Hall. The movement launched that day on March 1st has become the Samil movement, and next year we will co commemorate its 100th centennial. This is, a sig this is significant in the history of the Korean people. Since the, since the founders of both South and North Korea were all part of the independence movement. Outside of Korea, it inspired a global movement for national self-determination throughout the 20th century. Ladies and gentlemen, great social transformation requires the active engagement of a broad public united in a pursuit of a common cause. That cause should be unification and is not the work of governments alone. Koreans from the North, South, as well as the diaspora must engage with one another on many different levels. Civic organizations and NGOs are the perfect means for such engagement. Understanding the need for a broad civil society coalition, I have been instrumental in launching and developing the action for Korea United. For Korea United. Since its launch with key partners in 2012, it has grown rapidly into the largest citizen movement for unification and now includes more than 1,000 organizations. It is making unprecedented progress in building civic consensus, bridging political, religious, and regional divides, and collaborating with government and other stakeholders to promote the cause of unification among Koreans everywhere. AKU organizes grassroots community education programs based on the Korean dream approach in provinces throughout Korea. These are coupled with activities through which participants, including refugees and defectors from the North, experience making unification a part of their everyday life. I believe those are some of the issues that our good ambassador raised. AKU is also building broad support and enthusiasm for unification through culture and arts, most notably with the new unification songs and 1K concerts featuring award-winning artists and top K-pop groups with significant reach and impact through social media targeted towards Korean youth. In addition to these efforts, AKU has joined with the Global Peace Foundation and other partners in the One Korea Global Campaign to advance the unification agenda with a wider global public. From expert forums like this one to youth exchanges, cultural initiatives, and social media, the One Korea Global Campaign is building awareness and generating support for the unified Korea on virtually every continent. Many of you are already actively engaged in the One Korea Global Campaign. And I invite all of you once again, to continue your work in this vital cause. Ladies and gentlemen, just last week, the, this nation and much of the world mourned the passing of former President George H.W. Bush. During his presidency, Bush 41 guided the U.S. and the world through historic changes from the fall of the Berlin Wall and German unification 
to the collapse of the Soviet empire with wisdom, foresight, and a steady hand. At that time, German unification was by no means guaranteed. The prevailing view was that reunification was a distant dream, and key leaders in Europe did not support a unified Germany. Despite these obstacles, President Bush worked behind the scenes in support of grassroots movement that led to unification in a way that established a major ally in Europe at peace with its neighbors and a bulwark against totalitarian aggression. Significantly, President Bush was able to advance German unification without alienating key Soviet leaders as they struggled to navigate major transformations in the USSR and its empire. There are clear lessons for Korea that can be drawn here. One is the importance of a strategic policy that has a clear end goal in mind, unification, and works towards it steadily and systematically. Another is to recognize and wisely support the popular movements that are dynamic and vital ingredients for transformation. As I have already pointed out, there is a groundswell of support for a unified Korea that draws on the highest ideals and historic aspirations of the Korean people. This is already well underway. Through a nationwide campaign we have pursued over the past eight years under the banner of action for Korea United. Additionally, this year alone, through the One Korea Global Campaign, we have convened international forums in Mongolia, India, Uganda, Japan, Ireland, and across the United States, especially with the Korean American community, a number of whom are gathered here today. Let's give all of them a round of applause. All of these efforts are to crescendo in March 1st of 2019, when Korea will have a major centennial celebration. All Koreans and the world will be reminded of the patriots that pioneered the path for national self-realization during the 20th century and planted the seeds for a new nation aligned to its founding mandate to serve all of humanity. We hope that this event could inspire a movement for national and regional transformation that will eventually lead to unification centered on the Korean dream. I urge the ROK, U.S., and other nations to recalibrate their approaches. I believe that the U.S. should widen its Korea focus, including denuclearization, in the larger context of a unified Korea. A unified Korea should become the clearly stated and actively pursued policy of the U.S. and ROK with the support of the community of nations. That would not mean unification on any terms, and certainly not on Pyongyang's terms. It would look to the aspirations of the Korea's independent movement and finally realize them. Ladies and gentlemen, now is the time for far-reaching vision, wise leadership, and bold action. Korea's historical quest for one free, independent, sovereign nation is no longer a distant dream. It should be the reality of tomorrow. As a good friend and famous contemporary poet, Chi Han Kim said, my dream, your dream, our dream, all become one in the Korean dream. Thank you all for supporting this movement to finally achieve the peaceful outcome of unification that can unleash a broader Asian renaissance for peace and prosperity. May God bless you and your families this holiday season and let us realize the Korean dream. Thank you, Dr. Moon, for your powerful speech. Obviously, it was a very positive, high energy, and very compassionate speech. Now, we have a final speaker of the session today. Uh, it's a Dr. Robert Schuller, who has been a good friend of Dr. Preston Moon and Global Peace Foundation. 
It's great to see you again here in Washington, D.C. Dr. Schuller, podium is yours. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Uh, almost everybody I've seen today, a lot of my old friends have come up to me and said, is, is your wife with you? And I say, no. And they go, oh. <laughs> and I, I understand that because my wife is uh, very, uh, what's, the, what's the best word? She's engaging. She's beautiful. I'm the luckiest man in the entire world. What can I say? But uh, today we've had an opportunity to hear from uh, the history of North Korea, and we get, we get to hear from the realists about North Korea, and then we get to hear of the optimist, and then we conclude with the dreamer. How does that sound, you know? <laughs> and and I, for me, that's, that's the way life works. You have to have this balance between the, Democrat, the Democrats and the Republicans. Every Democrat has to thank God for the Republicans. And every Republican has to thank God for the, for the Democrats. Without it, we don't have a two-party system. Without a two-party system, we don't have any tension. Without any tension, you can't create the music that makes life work. All right? We can't, well, this country would not be what it is with a single-party system. The world wouldn't be what it is without the realists and the optimists. We have to have a dream if we're going to go anywhere, if we're going to succeed. Because a realist can easily, in fact anybody, can, can open an apple and you can count how many seeds are in the apple, right? Is there anyone here who doesn't think they can do that? Anyone could do that. But only God can count the apples in a seed. Jeremy, only God can count the apples in a seed. Now, we've been drawn here today for a reason. Not a single person is here by accident. We are here today because God has called you here. He's called you here for a purpose and a reason, and I don't know what those reasons are any more than I know how many apples are in a seed. But what I do know is that together, collectively, we can move the ball to reunify the Korea's peninsula and create peace. And the message I want you to, to, to gird your feet with is this. And you say, what in the world is he talking about? Gird your feet. You know, the St. Paul wrote a letter to, to, to the Ephesians. And that letter is recorded in the Bible. And in there he tells the, the Ephesians that we need to protect ourselves from evil. That we are in a spiritual world. And as spiritual people, we need to gird ourselves against evil. And so he gave us the tools with which to to protect ourselves. And he talks about the breastplate and the helmet and the sword. And one of the things he says is for us to put on our feet the good news of peace. Did you hear that? On our feet we put the good news of peace. So what does that mean for us? That means we are here today to put on the good news of peace and let the world know communicate with one another. So here today we can network. And we, commu can, we can communicate with each other the good news that we can find in peace. That peace will prevail. It always does. It will prevail. We can continue to not only network here today with each other, but we can network with our with our networks. How many people here have a Twitter account? If you're young enough, I'm sure you do. Man, some of you are old enough do. How many have a Facebook account? And you have friends on Facebook. How many people have a Facebook account? Okay, how many, how many people have a, a YouTube channel? Anyone have a YouTube channel? There, there are ways to communicate today to gird our feet, to communicate the messages that we hear today, and network. 
We can do that. There are things we can do to move the ball. We can do that. You can participate and listen to and, and, and friend with the Global Peace Foundation. They have a Facebook page. They keep us up to speed on what's going on with the Koreas and what we can do to, to promote peace. And then you can join me. I'm going to Korea. I'm going to Korea. I'll be there on the 26th of February participating in a small little event. I, I'm being sarcastic because this is going to be a world-changing event. And I want to encourage you to invite your friends. I'm bringing some friends with me. And we're going to be in Korea, again, moving the ball of peace. We're putting peace on our feet. We're proclaiming to, our, to the world in every possible, way we, every possible way we can the dream to unify the peninsula. The reality is there. The history is there. But we also have the optimism and the dream. And with the power of God before us, there is nothing we cannot do. Nothing. With a word, God spoke and he separated the firmament from above. With a word, God spoke and everything that is ever that exists came into being. And every single thing that comes into being today started with an idea and a dream. And the reunification of the Korean Peninsula will happen. I'm praying it's in my lifetime. If it's not mine, it'll be in my kids or my grandkids. It's just a matter of time. And it will happen. Because the word has been spoken. The dream has been born. And once it's there, you can't go backwards. Can you say amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's have church. God love you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Schuler, for that inspiring conclusion. Uh, let's give one more round of applause to our distinguished panel for their uh, very insightful and important contributions today. We'd like, we'd like to invite you to join in networking. We have uh, behind us this beautiful rotunda. We have refreshments for you and the opportunity to further our discussions. Thank you again for joining us here today, and we appreciate working together on the One Korea Global Campaign. Thank you, and we stand adjourned.